Hi, and a very warm welcome to everyone here today. It's a lot of people, and we're a little bit late, so I think we'll get to it straight away. My name is Louise Rebinder. I'm director at Exponential Roadmap Initiative, and we are going to be talking about the value chain and things that can be done that are being done there to reduce emissions. And uh, we have a fantastic panel with us here today, but we will start with a presentation. I'll bring uh, Pamela up on stage. Pamela, yes, come, come here. Sorry for starting so quickly now, but well, it's uh, running a little bit out of time. Hi, Pamela Juven. And you are director at, uh, for SME Climate Hub Absolutely. at Women Business Coalition. Uh, great to have you. We have been working uh, together quite a lot. And this is kind of the first part of this panel where we will be talking about SME Climate Hub, a platform to support small and medium sized companies in the value chain. And there are a lot of them. There are indeed, including as part of you know, value chains, global supply chains, as you were saying. But let's start maybe with a bit of a presentation of the hub. So as you said, the hub is a global initiative, the global initiative in a way for SME climate action. We operate a digital platform that provides SMEs with tools and resources that are free of charge to help them work towards net zero. We're an initiative of the Women Business Coalition created in partnership with the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and the United Nations. Uh, race to zero campaign. So what do we do? You can see our three pillars of activity here. These are the SME Common Hub basics. We have a commitment process, of course. This is how we started initially as an ambition initiative. So SMEs can commit to reaching a net zero by 2050 on the hub, which also means having emissions by 2030 and disclosing their progress on a yearly basis. That's in a nutshell what they commit to when they make the SME comment commitment on the platform. And when they make the commitment, they also automatically join the Race to Zero campaign. But of course, we also want to provide SMEs with the tools that they need to meet their commitments, which is why we have resources that help them measure their emissions, but also take action, a number of educational tools. Uh, these range from very simple action guides uh, that provide bite-sized information to help SMEs take specific actions in their business, all the way to more sophisticated, interactive, sector-specific courses for SMEs. And we also have a reporting tool to help SMEs uh, promote their efforts, disclose their progress to their stakeholders, whether that's corporate buyers or financial institutions, any stakeholders that they're working with. To this day, over 8,000 SMEs have made the SME comment commitment on the website from over 130 countries. We have many more also that are using our tools and resources, so we're becoming a really important community of small businesses worldwide. And I should have said that for us, SMEs are organizations with fewer than 500 employees. So any organization of that size can make the commitment on the hub. Now, if we take a little bit of a step back, maybe, and talk about SMEs, so why are we focusing on SMEs? We have some interesting stats to provide if we move on to the next slide. So first of all, and many of you, oh, I am the one with a clicker. Yes. That's incredible. Uh, there you go. I'm very independent. OK, great. So many of you will know this already, but SMEs account for 90% of businesses worldwide, 70% of the world's workforce, and 50% of global GDP. So they really do play a key role, both at community level, they're the backbone of local communities, and of global supply chains, which is the reason why it's so important to talk about SMEs when you talk about value chains. And you might think that you know, individually they have a small impact, which is true, but collectively they can really help move the needle on climate. It is estimated that SMEs together account for between 50 and 64% of total business sector emissions. Uh, now, we also know that they're more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, which is yet another reason why we need to make sure that they're brought on board uh, to net zero. Um, we know that 50 to 60, 40, sorry, to 60% of them never reopen after disaster. Of course, SMEs have uh, more localized supply chains, customer bases, staff, infrastructure. Uh, they have less liquidity, so it is understandable that many of them might shut down when faced to the severe uh, weather events that we're seeing with climate change. 
So we need SMEs to take action on climate, uh, to become more resilient in businesses, and also to help supply chains become more resilient. But they cannot be expected to go it alone. We cannot put a disproportionate burden on them because we know that they're very resource poor. So we need to work together as an ecosystem. So we need corporate buyers, financial institutions, government, business associations. We need all these actors to come together to support SMEs. Now, we run annual surveys to better understand the barriers and motivators of SMEs in our community. And you can see some really interesting stats here. So you'll see that the top barriers that SMEs mention uh, when they're asked about why it's challenging for them to take on that action. I'm not going to look at my notes because it's very small on the slide. Uh, so 52% so of them mentioned the lack of policies or government-sponsored benefits. Uh, another 52% mentioned the lack of funding. And 39% of them uh, mentioned the lack of data about current emissions. So these are really key barriers for them. However, we also know that 84% of them have not been offered any financial incentives to take action on climate. 63% of our surveyed SMEs have not been asked by stakeholders to reduce emissions, and only 17% of them have been asked by their corporate stakeholders to reduce emissions. So th this really speaks to the need for corporates to contribute to this effort, to bring their SMEs on board. And this is why we have launched a new campaign at the SME Climate Hub called the SME, oops, the SME Climate Ambition Drive. So essentially with this campaign, we're trying to bring together different ecosystem stakeholders from corporates and corporate buyers all the way to banks, financial institutions, business associations, governments. So all these different types of actors who have SMEs in their value chains, in their networks, so that they can really encourage these SMEs to take action and make the commitment on the website. So all these organizations, large stakeholders, can join us as campaign supporters and provide them with all the tools that they need, the resources, to engage these smaller players. We have designed specific guidance that's available on the website for these campaign supporters, and we need their help really to promote our efforts. Uh, our goal is to reach 10,000 SME commitments, 10,000 SME commitments by COP29. We're working very closely with the Climate Champions team to do this, and we certainly hope that if you are a large organization sitting in this room, you'll join us to promote this effort. And there will be plenty of opportunities, of course, uh, to benefit from this campaign, both for SMEs, but also for campaign supporters in terms of communications, media, uh, different types of activities, speaking opportunities. And so we need to work together for that. We do, and we really hope we reach that 10,000. And uh, I don't know if uh, when we're talking about SMEs in the supply chain or um, business customers as well, um, it's, it's a large number that you will have in your supply chains if you're a large corporate. It could be 90%, 95% also there. So it's a large part of the supply chains. Um, and um, uh, thank you so much, Pamela. I know you need to leave, uh, but we're really hoping for this campaign. We're working on it together, uh, and we'll make it great. And looking forward to seeing the numbers by COP29. Thank you very much, Louise. And just to say, so there's an email address on the slide. Of course, even though I need to go, um, uh, our wonderful BRI colleagues, exponential roadmap colleagues can talk more about the hub, but also feel free to reach out directly if you want to discuss the hub, our tools, but also how we're working with corporates, including as part of the SME Climate Ambition Drive. All right. Thank you, Thank Pamela. You very much. Thank you. And now uh, we, I will bring up the rest of the panel on stage, all of us, please. Uh, yes, Anna, Besma, Johan, and James. We have uh, Johan Falk, CEO and co-founder of Exponential Roadmap Initiative. You can sit here next to me. Okay. And we can you. move this back, Thanks. Elizabeth, so I can see the others. Mm. I can move this to the front. Um, 
And then we have uh, James Wangi, um, founder and CEO of Africa Climate Ventures. We have Besma Jarbo, head of supplier carbon solutions at Apple. And we have Anna Selsing, CSO of Alpha Laval. Very welcome. And I thought to have uh, everyone on stage to make it a little bit cozier, but I want uh, you one uh, to first share Thank a few you. words about the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and uh, why we're here talking about the value chains. Yeah, the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. Uh, we bring together the leading transformers and disruptors taking action to have emissions by 2030 through exponential climate action and solutions. So that is our key mission. And I'm really excited about this session, talking about value chain transformation. Um, if you look on the global level, about 90% of the economy is under some kind of net zero target. On the other hand, we know that we haven't bent the curve yet. We know that we need to follow the carbon law, halving emissions by 2030. We haven't bent the curve yet. One of the key strategies is definitely radical, deep transformation of the value chains. We're talking about the mobility value chain, transport value chain, food and land, ICT, and so on. So that is an absolutely central element. And I think companies realized that they can't reach net zero on their own. You have to do it together with your suppliers and customers. And it doesn't stop there because there might be blocking policies. So you need to work together with your peers up and downstream to actually remove some of these blockers. So it's a completely new approach. It's not about scope three accounting. Accounting is incredibly important. It's actually about deep transportation, business innovation and development. And um, so what is it about? What are some of the best practices? It's really important not to get stuck in detailed numbers. It's important to understand the big picture, but actually getting to action. So if you look at the, what we call the upstream supplier side, what is a key action? Well, be sure to ask, request your suppliers to have emissions by 2030 to join on the journey. And your small suppliers as well, as Pamela talked about, don't leave them out. You have to bring them in as well. Uh, it's about uh, implementing efficient renewable energy through the value chain. That's an absolute key action. It's also about driving the material transformation. We can't do the energy transformation sequentially and then the material transformation. Possibly we can reach a third through the energy transformation, but the second and third halving, we have to run the material transformation. Then of course, transportation, solutions available to cut by 50%. But it's also about the downstream, downstream your customers integrate circularity, ensure to build products which have longer life, a second life, and recirculating all material. Um, and it's also about policy influencing. We talked about that to remove blockers. It's also about financing the transformation to supporting your suppliers, your innovators, to actually and paying uh, green premiums for these products and bring in climate solutions companies and innovators as part of the work. So to conclude, um, value chain transformation is a completely new ball game. And I would say that uh, companies need to work deeply in that to be competitive uh, the next couple of years. So it's great to have some, some of the front running company series can actually show some of the best practices and examples. Thank you. Thank you, Yuan. And uh, yeah, we will hear some of the, the very good best practices here uh, from the panel today. And it's quite exciting, this transformation that we will be needing and what it will actually look like going forward. We have a f not many years, but we have a few years. Um, so we'll see a lot of fantastic things, I expect. Uh, so we will invite the rest of the panel I'm moving to the front here so I can also see Besma a little bit. Um, so uh, just to get everyone on board uh, about what these um, uh, 
people on stage what your companies do. So can you quickly please, um, yeah. starting with you, what you... Yes. Alfa Laval, yeah, we are many times behind the scene, but we are very much also at the heart of energy transition. Uh, we produce and have we are core uh, technologies that are heat transfer, separation and fluid handling. And this is just one little model of a heat uh, exchanger that is quite powerful. They're much larger in reality, but this has a potential to save 100 gigawatts watts per year. Uh, that's a lot of emissions. And we are in the middle of energy transition that could be uh, fuel cells, that could be carbon capture, long duration storage, but also say, cleaning uh, water and uh, doing marine transportation in a sustainable way. So we have quite a broad uh, portfolio, but very much about both saving energy by energy efficiency, like this one is doing, and then also providing clean energy together with partners uh, across the world. Thank you, Besma. That's the first time I've ever had a dog walk across. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Next to the fellow panelists. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Besma. I work at a little company called Apple that I see many of you are well familiar with. Um, we make technology that enriches people's lives. Um, and we want the way that we run our operations and the way we make our technology to protect and enrich people's lives and the planet that we all share. So we are committed to what we call Apple 2030. And that's a commitment across our entire corporate value chain to reduce our emissions by 75% by 2030. And for the remaining 25% that we can't reduce by 2030, we're going to use high quality carbon removals while we continue to push as much as possible to decarbonize even further for the post 2030 timeframe. So looking forward Thank to talking more. Yeah, and James, um, a little bit about your background and uh, yes. uh, your company. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, again, James Mwangi from Africa Climate Ventures. Spent most of my career until quite recently working on questions of economic development and inclusive growth and have refocused to really unlock Africa's potential to be a critical part of the global path to net zero. Why, you ask? Because it's the largest growing population, massive land mass, huge amounts of natural resources, and the largest single concentration of untapped renewable energy on planet Earth. Whether you're trying to leapfrog to new technologies and greener solutions for that growing pool of consumers, whether you're trying to decarbonize existing supply chains by changing where you do stuff to align with where the energy and the raw materials are, or whether you're asking where can you really take carbon removals to massive scale because you have the labor, the land, the geology, the latitude uh, to do it. We believe Africa is a solution to all of those and we're investing in companies we believe will be world beaters because of the unfair advantage of being located in Africa. All right, thank you. Um, we'll go into a little bit a little bit deeper on what these uh, companies do now. And maybe we start again with you, Anna. Yeah. Uh, if you could highlight a certain area that you think would be suitable for the looking at yeah, the supply chain. Uh, you, and you mean supply chain? Uh, yes, yes supply of chain. course. Uh, uh, we work, uh, as this one uh, shows, this is made of metal, and we have a lot of metal in our supply chain. We also have a great many SMEs, so we're very uh, thankful for the work uh, that is ongoing with Pamela and the others. But we need to figure out how can we get metal uh, fossil free. So we are working a lot with our partners, uh, the suppliers of metals, and we've actually also produced and sold the first fossil or near fossil free heat exchanger to the market. So this is something very, very important to work across. Uh, we have Boliden, we have SSAB, we have Autocompo, big companies that we work very closely. There's, it's like being uh, colleagues. Uh, we meet with them probably every week to try to figure this out together. Uh, it's not going to be enough of green steel out there for us, but we need to also figure out with these companies and others, how can we find enough recycled materials also. So that's something we do, for example, with Bolin and Autocumpo. Uh, and then, on the other hand, how can we help our supply chain also to be more efficient, working more efficiently using our products? Uh, and, of course, as I know you're working a lot with uh, Vesma to 
uh, help to transfer to renewables as much as possible. We ourselves are uh, now sourcing 97% globally and the only thing stopping us is that we can't find enough renewables out there. Uh, so yes, those are some examples. That's a good transition maybe. Besma, yeah. you were going to mention about renewables, I think. Oh, I could talk about renewables yes. all day. <laughs> I'll say, well, when looking at our value chain, right, manufacturing by far is the largest single part of our, of our value chain and um, the emissions. And so electricity in manufacturing is the single largest part. So while we have three pillars, the first, and uh, Johan kind of gave a great example, but if it's, it's designing in a low carbon manner from the very beginning, right? Designing so that we are using renewable and recycled materials and that we are designing with circularity in mind. Um, so when it comes to metals, right, we, we're really trying to shift and move to recycled metals and um, recycled aluminum is, is one thing that we've been working on for many years. Um, using 100% renewable energy. So Apple's corporate operations have been running on 100% renewable energy since 2018. And by 2030, our entire manufacturing supply chain will be running on renewable energy. Um, and then the final thing that we're doing is on our direct emissions, how to minimize that. And so minimizing it with efficiency, with electrification and, and with abatement. Um, and so, yeah, renewable energy, we've been working on that with our suppliers since 2015. So we have a supplier energy efficiency program and a supplier clean energy program. Um, we first started out by going to our main suppliers and really asking them to, to make a commitment, but it was a contractual commitment, like commit to us that you are going to run on 100% renewable energy for your Apple. Um, and we've made really great progress. So over the years, we now have over 320 suppliers that have made that contractual commitment to us. Um, those suppliers make up over 95% of our manufacturing spend. Um, and it's not just commitments. Um, last year, we, in the supply chain, our suppliers procured over 16 and a half gigawatts of renewable energy. Um, we've made so much progress that it's no longer voluntary for them to you know, come and commit. We've made it mandatory this year that all suppliers have to run on renewable energy. Can I just add that you said 60 and these can uh, save 100 gigawatts, so it's kind of fascinating <laughs> so we be... what we can actually do if we yeah. find the right solutions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, materials and, uh, and metals and renewable energy, that is for the tech and mech, ICT, IT industry is two of the major hotspots finding solutions for that. Uh, so good job, both of you. And I know that I was um, in my former role, I was looking into how other tech and IT companies were working on uh, in their supply chain. And, and Apple was one that I came across many, many years back. And it was, uh, it was fantastic because you can, from external information, you could see what you were doing and read quite thorough, uh, thoroughly and Apple's understand very thorough. as well. <laughs> and we try to be as transparent as possible. Yes. Yeah, yeah you're, you were being very transparent and congratulate you for that. That was a good job. Um, I want to go to, to James. Um, so Africa has great potential. Yes. Um, why have we not really come further there with using that potential? I think I'll start with a paradox. I'll bet you, as we talk about renewable energy right now, and the word oh, Africa is mentioned, everyone thinks about a very important statistic, 600 million people living without electricity, energy poverty, what will we ever do to get those people power? What you don't go to is Africa, 60% of the world's best solar, 40% of the world's untapped renewables, period. Mm. And take any system of storage plus renewables, um, you can deploy, this, you can get the same amount of baseload renewable power for a third of the cost in Africa as you can in Germany, simply because you need a lot less PV and wind blades to get the same amount of energy. And we don't have winter, so no seasonal variation, so a lot less storage. The problem is you can't finance it. And the reason you can't finance it is there's no bankable demand. In other words, all of those big, heavy energy sink industries aren't in Africa. And you know what's maddening about it? The reason they're not in Africa is there's no established electrical grid, mm. right? So there's a, there's a classic chicken and egg problem and I'm looking at yeah. both of these companies and I'm thinking to myself, we have nothing but energy looking for demand and how do you begin to bring the two things together? We have gotten used to a system where we say, well, first a country on its own balance sheet builds out an energy system and then industry comes to use that energy. 
And I think in the age of renewables, which are hard to move over long distances and have finite you know, usability across long distance, we need to ask which industries will move. And in a sense, as you build up new manufacturing or processing capacity, you're actually decarbonizing. One example is almost a quarter, more than a quarter of the world's aluminum comes from Africa. If all we did was use Africa's renewables to process Africa's bauxite, you could cut global emissions by 400 million tons a year. No other change other than unlocking that investment. And we can repeat that trick across multiple materials. And that's before we get to the end of life. So this is materials and early processing. On the other end, we talk about second life recycling, reprocessing, re, you know, reusing materials. You need labor forces to do that, to do the separations and so on. And then you need energy. And again, where is it that you have that young labor force ready to do this work if there was an investment in their energy systems? Africa, which then also happens to be where a lot of the consumers of the future will be. So there's a set of paradoxes there that create a poverty trap, if you look at it one way, but could create a really exciting virtuous cycle if we're saying go where the energy is, where the raw materials are, where the labor is, and use that to accelerate decarbonization across mm -hmm. value chains for the planet. Yeah. Thank you, James. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you won, uh, first, if you have any uh, reflections, but also, um, what would we need listening to this and also from what you know from before, what, what can we do to make things go a little bit faster when it comes to trans transforming the value chain that we need to? I, I think it's first really important to realize that it is possible to cut emissions, it is possible to transform the value chains because you hear sometimes that message is how difficult it is, yeah? It's not simple. But you see from these examples, it's absolutely possible. You just have to do the work. And it's particularly tough for the ones in the front line. But then I think we need to really try to realize how we can develop you know, best practices and share these best practices and how, how the front runners can actually uh, support uh, to trigger some of the post positive tipping points. So we get, we get more companies on board and where we come, come together actually to accelerate the demand as well. So the, the demand of course on, on, on materials but also on renewable energy. I'm also very much in favor of, of uh, much, much more investments in local renewable energy, not just relying on the grid, but actually building out renewable energy close to the facilities. And I think that is an excellent opportunity for the big industries and also to connect it to what you said, uh, said James. So if we, we go back to the areas, uh, Anna, you want to say something? No, else? no, if you, but, but I just wanted to say what you want to uh, build on that, that I really see that transparency, as you're saying, uh, is very, very important for us to make this go faster because we need the numbers to show both that we're doing the right thing to get paid for the right thing, but we also get, need to get the, the numbers from our suppliers. And that's a huge challenge at the moment. So we're really trying to figure out things together with other big companies uh, and have a big partnership on that massive plus, we call it, with Microsoft and the entire value chain of stainless steel. So those things, I think, are really important. They sound on the boring side, but if you can't show it, then it's not worth it. So that's one thing. Agreed. More transparency. I, that is what is also so very inspiring to others to take after and see, as you say, what's possible. And um, Besma, do you have um, what is making this a success, and what can you, what would you need to make it be even faster in um, progress? Yeah, I mean, we've we've offered a lot of resources to our suppliers, right? A lot of times, we're the first company that's ever come to them asking for these things. Um, so over the years, we, we put in place, you know, we've shown them how to report their greenhouse gas emissions. We have a training academy that teaches them how to procure renewable energy in their markets, in their local languages, for their local conditions. Um, we have donated those resources and we've helped to create a public academy um, that's already launched trainings in uh, China and Vietnam and hopefully more countries soon. So um, we're trying to get all of these resources and put them in public places so that more can benefit from them. Um, but the biggest thing that we 
focus our time on and we want more of our suppliers and more companies to participate in is policy advocacy. That is absolutely crucial because, I mean, clean energy is the backbone of the future low carbon economy and we need it everywhere. We need it in Africa, we need it, we need it everywhere. Um, and uh, it's been our biggest blocker. Um, so we were really excited. We co-founded this group called the Asia Clean Energy Coalition last year. Um, it was bringing together corporates and it was bringing NGOs, local and international, and the renewable energy industry, all to kind of get one voice to be able to go to the governments that where our supply chains are and to be very directed and focused on what our asks are. Um, and they're making really great, great progress there as well. Mm -hmm. Directed and, and, and focused, that is one thing for, for the companies when they're uh, trying to take the next step. There's quite a lot of information to, to look at and it's kind of hard to find the, the right initiative, especially when it comes to like renewable energy in, in Asia and China, where to go can be quite hard to find the right guidance there. So it's uh, good to hear about these, um, these initiatives. Um, so if we look near term, long term, where do you see uh, first, uh, Joanna, where progress can be made? Well, again, the transparency data, but then we also, as I think you mentioned in the beginning, Johan, that it's not just energy, it's also material. And we really need to together drive more for the circular economy. Uh, and we are very dependent on getting back again metals, for example, and that our supplier get back the metals. So we work very much and try to do this in pilot scales. So we have partnerships with Stena Recycling and Aparam and other global partners to get products back, to get the material back. And I think that's uh, also uh, policies are, are needed to make this easier. Uh, there's so much we need to do together as an ecosystem. Uh, and that's where we really need to focus more going forward. forward. So I think the more we can develop together with the front runners, the, the sort of the best practices, the leading practices and share it openly to create that excitement and the critical mass. If, when we get sufficient number of companies on board, it will be a, a self-fulfilling uh, basically a process, a snowball effect. We haven't really come to that point, but it can absolutely hap happen. So that's one thing. Another thing is I think we need to really untap that the countries and regions and cities see this as a tremendous opportunity actually to link with the net zero next generation value chains. It's both about uh, attracting investments in terms of industry. So, it's, um, so that's one piece of it, of course. Uh, but it's also to build a new economy and the new value add in the economy. Uh, and if we get that understanding that it's not the, primarily about sharing of burdens to cut emissions, but actually how to grow the new wealth and economy. And that by working together with some of these leading chains and companies, that is the opportunity. So we get this, what we call an exponential race to the top, where we get the actors trying to get ahead, ahead of the curve. I think that will be a game changer and we can work in that direction. Maybe I'll pick up from there because yes. that's actually the focus of an initiative we've been supporting called the Africa Green Industrialization yes. Initiative. That's exactly about saying how do we break out of the trap that says because Africa is 4 or 5 percent of global emissions today, it's kind of besides the, mm -hmm. the point on the race to zero. And instead say we're building a new low emissions or negative emissions economy. Yeah. which places are well positioned to succeed and compete in that space. And I think the question there really becomes how do we think about not just technology and innovation and incentives, but location as a lever you can pull in your value chain, right? Where is it that you're just moving raw materials unprocessed when you could process them and so on? And the beauty of that, and maybe this is where I'll end, is you know, this is New York Climate Week, it's also the UN General Assembly. So there's conversations on the race to zero and there's a set of different conversations about the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And my argument is actually, if, you, if we get this idea that actually let's do things where it makes most planetary sense to do them, both of those goals are solved by tackling each other. You solve equity and you solve climate action in the same actions. I think we're uh, uh, coming towards the end of uh, the program now and just very quickly starting uh, from Anna and moving this way, wish list. If you could wish for something to make transition go faster. 
On top of everything else, on top said, of everything. Uh, then I would say that I would love to see a price of, on nature uh, or carbon emissions at least that is uh, global uh, because it has to, again to pay off to do the right thing. Uh, we, need, uh, we need that. Right. I was going to echo on something that I heard yesterday at the opening of Climate Week where um, a Nigerian official, uh, sorry, Nigerian Norwegian official, um, so, so, talked about price on carbon more regulation to set boundaries and targets, um, and more financial incentives. So those three things. Amen to what went before, and greater imagination. Let's, uh, there are no victims. There's no time for victims in this moment right now. Everyone must climb in, and we must all get to work. All right. You want? Yeah, I would say to add to what you all said, again, how we can shift the narrative from sharing of burdens to actually positive exponential race to the top, uh, growing wealth and the new economy. That's what I was saying. All right. Uh, I don't know if I can make a wish as well, but uh, I love to see transparency and when companies do these examples and have positive examples and really celebrating when good things are done. I love to see that and more of that. Um, so I think uh, I will thank the panel. <laughs> we did not have enough time because it would be lovely to hear more. But uh, we thank Pamela who had to run away. And then we have Anna Selsing from Alfa Laval, Bess Maljarbo from Apple, James Wangi from Africa Climate Ventures, and then Yuan Falk from Expansion Roadmap Initiative. Thank you. Thank you.